Uh, well, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know we've got a new sermon series. I think we've got the slide here teaching us to pray the Psalms, maybe. Yes, there it is. Teach us to pray, praying the Psalms. You know, if we really want to know how to pray the way we ought to pray. In fact, uh, Paul writes in Romans 8 that we don't know how to pray how we ought. We need the Holy Spirit to, to help us pray what we ought to pray. And so we know that we can turn to the Psalms because the Psalms are the great prayer book of the Bible. People have been, the people of God have been praying the Psalms for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the Psalms, and if you look at the whole book of the Psalter, the Psalms, you know, it's written in five books. It's divided into five books. And we began our journey through the Psalms by first looking at a Psalm from book one. It was Psalm 32 that uh, Kim Talley preached on Ash Wednesday. It's a beautiful Psalm of confession. Uh, pointing out that as David wrote, and most of the Psalms in book one are credited to David as if David wrote most of them. And so in Psalm 32, he points out that his bones were wasting away while he held on to his sin. Until he confessed his sin, his soul was rotting. And it's true that when we try to cover up our sins, it's not good for our souls. We need to, we need to confess our sins to God, and we need to confess our sins to one another, as James, the brother of Jesus, encourages us to do. But the Psalms is not just filled with psalms of confession. If it was, it'd be kind of depressing, to be honest. Uh, we also have beautiful psalms of praise. In fact, the last psalm in the Psalter is Psalm 150. And uh, the last word in the Psalter, the last word in Psalm 150 is hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, which is such an appropriate word to end uh, the psalms with because most of the psalms, whether it be psalms of confession or even psalms of lament, will ultimately end in some type of praise, you know, praise the Lord. We, we praise the Lord for all that God has done for us because the, the psalms, as we pray these psalms, as we read and meditate, and begin to pray these psalms, they begin to transform us. God uses the psalms and the psalter to, to change us. For as we give our burdens to God, as we confess our sins to God, as we lament before God, we know that we have a God who loves us, a God who hears us, a God who forgives us, a God who is with us. And so we, our hearts turn to praise. But what's been interesting for me as I've been going through the psalms uh, and, and our encouragement uh, during Lent, this season of preparation, where we're spending 40 days kind of preparing for the glorious celebration of Easter and Holy Week. We're asking everyone not to give up some kind of food, although you could if you wanted to. I know a lot of people want to give up dessert or give up chocolate or give up bacon. I'll never ask you to give up bacon, okay? I love bacon. So I wouldn't ask that of you. I, I practice what I preach, right? So, But what I do think would be good is to take on a, a psalm, maybe to read a different psalm each day, pray, meditate upon it, and then make it your own prayer. And as I've been going through the Psalms, what's interesting to me is the most common form of Psalms are actually Psalms of lament, Psalms of complaint, which is ironic for me because Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? In fact, we read in Galatians chapter 5 that joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. As, as children of God, shouldn't we be filled with joy, not lament, not complaint? not grief. And yet the truth is, King David points out, and the sons of Korah and Asaph, as we'll see this morning, point out that life does not always go the way we hoped it would. That there are times when we need to lament, we need to grieve, because life is not going well. As we saw last week with book two, we looked at Psalm 42 and, and Psalm 43, and, 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 and we saw that in those Psalms, the sons of Korah were complaining that life is not the way that it used to be. They used to gather together in the temple in Jerusalem, and, and they would lead the festival of praise, but now they're living in exile far and far away from, from Jerusalem, from the temple, from the seeming presence of God. And so they lament. Things aren't the way they used to be. Boy, that's true for us today, isn't it? Things are not the way they used to be. At least not for me. I, I remember growing up in Midland, Texas, which is just four hours south of here, in the 70s and 80s. Anybody remember the 70s and 80s? Some of y'all? Okay, yeah, yeah. Kids, you can watch about it, read about it. You watch the Goldbergs, you'll get a little bit of view of the 80s, right? <laughs> 70s and 80s, right? That was a good time, particularly in Texas. In fact, I remember in the 70s and 80s, we had these things called blue laws in Texas. Do you remember that? Where certain retailers couldn't sell certain items. And so a lot of retailers were actually closed on Sundays. In fact, very few things were open on Sundays. And so there was this social pressure even to go to worship on Sundays because there was nothing else to do. I mean, you had to go to worship, right? In fact, you used to ask people in Midland growing up, I'd say, hey, where do you go to church? 
not if you go to church, but where. The assumption was we all went somewhere because that was the cultural expectation. But we don't have blue laws anymore. In fact, a lot of studies have been done, and it's interesting to note that uh, through these nationwide studies of churches, they found that the average worship attender only attends corporate worship 18 times a year. 18 times. There's 52 weeks in a year. 18 out of 52 is not a very good average unless you're playing Major League Baseball, right? I mean, that's 340-something, right? That's, that's not that great an average. 18 out of 52? Gosh, where is everybody gone? What are they doing? I remember as a kid, we didn't have uh, kids' sports leagues play on Sundays. The thing we did on Sundays is we went to worship. I often took a nap. I watched the Cowboys play, and then I went to youth group on Sundays. Sunday was the Lord's Day, but things aren't that way anymore, are they? In fact, it's interesting talking about no longer honoring the Sabbath the way we used to. Uh, a recent study was done by Deloitte, which is a accounting firm, big consulting firm of over 1,000 U.S. professionals. They found that 77% of these U.S. professionals all complain of burnout. Burnout. You ever experienced burnout? It's like when you're taking a candle and you're trying to burn the wick at both ends and you're, you just lose all energy. In fact, listen to these classic symptoms of burnout according to WebMD. First is you feel exhausted. Have you ever feel exhausted before? Like, man, I've just had a rough week, a rough month, a rough year. I feel like I have no energy. I feel exhausted. Or maybe you begin, the second symptom is you become cynical, negative, negative about work, negative about whether or not you'll ever be able to get it all done, negative about whether or not the, the workload will ever lighten. The third symptom of burnout is simply depression. You're depressed because you feel inadequate, as if you're not good enough. You'll never be able to get it all done. Yes, burnout is a, a big problem. It's been a big problem since 2020 in our country. It continues to rise, the experiences of burnout, as there's a lot of layovers or layoffs and turnover in, in companies, and, and then there's a lot of people who are quitting, and it's kind of that quiet quitting's happening, and, and others are having to pick up the load while others leave. And I know my wife and I have experienced this at our work with lots of turnover, and when people leave, you've got to pick up the, the slack, and you've got to rehire, and you've got to retrain, and, and you find yourself, well, the work will never end. It never feels like we... We'll have enough time to do everything that needs to get done. And so we feel burnout. What's the answer to burnout? I believe Psalm 79 tells us how we can avoid burnout. Psalm 79, it's in book three of the Psalter. Very similar to Psalms 42 and 43, which are Psalms of Lament. However, it's slightly different because Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are, are individual Psalms of Lament. It's written in the first person singular but Psalm 79 is written in the first person, plural. It's intended to be a communal psalm of lament. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand with me here, and we're going to read Psalm 79 responsively. I'll read the, old, the odd verses, and if you could read the even verses, and then we'll read verse 13 together. Psalm 79, verses 1 to 13. Psalm 79 is Psalm of Asaph. O oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy, jealousy burn like fire? For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Help us, O God, of our salvation. For the glory of your name, deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you according to your great power. Preserve those doomed to die. (laughs) 
But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Please be seated. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, as we have opened up your word, we pray that by your spirit you would continue to guide us in the hearing and guide me in the preaching of your holy word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Looking again at those first three verses. Oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They've come into the city of Jerusalem. They've defiled your holy temple. The temple was only the place for the Jews, Gentiles, non-Jews, pagan Gentiles specifically. Those who worshipped foreign gods were not to enter the temple or it would become defiled. The enemies of these foreign nations with their foreign gods have entered the temple. They have defiled it. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. You know, as we were planning on Tuesday for this worship service, we always get together as a staff, and I was talking to Kelly Glass, who's a great children's director, but I was like, you know, that's a really tough children's sermon, Psalm 79. May want to go with something different. I mean, that's just, it's kind of a gross scene, right? Psalm 1 to 3, it's like, oh my gosh, these first three verses. I mean, the blood is pouring out like water. And in ancient times, it was the greatest insult was to not, bury, not to bury your enemies, but to let the vultures eat their flesh. The people of Jerusalem have been conquered, and they don't even have the time or the people to bury their own dead. And so their dead lie as their blood pours out like water, and the vultures are eating at their flesh. And not only have they been defeated, but now they're being taunted. Things seem to go from bad to worse, as you read in verse 4 and 5. We've become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. As we see later in verse 10, they ask the question, where is their God? It was believed in ancient times that every nation had its own God or gods. And that if you offered the right worship to your God, then your God would give you victory in battle. And if another nation is able to defeat you, then that means their God is greater than your God. And so they're mocking Israel, who only claims to have one God, which was unique in that time. They worshiped Yahweh, and yet Yahweh did not deliver them this time. Their enemies with their foreign gods have defeated them. And so they ask, where are their gods? And so the people of Israel feel defeated. And so they say, how long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy jealousy burn like fire? How long, O Lord? That's the great question of Psalm 79. How long, O Lord, will you allow our enemies to conquer us, to defeat us, to taunt us? How long, O Lord, when will you deliver us? Notice that the psalmist, even in the midst of defeat, still knows that God is sovereign. God is all-powerful, in control, and they know that they've been defeated because God has allowed them to experience defeat. And they even have enough self-awareness to recognize that their defeat is a result of their own sin. We see this in verse 8 when they say, Do not remember against us our former iniquities. The people of Israel recognize that they did something wrong to allow God, to move God, to allow the enemies to defeat them. In fact, we saw it in verse 5 when they, they say, Will your jealousy burn like fire? What was the sin of Israel that would, that would move God to jealousy? What was the sin of Israel that, that would make God so upset that he would allow the enemies of Jerusalem to defeat them? What was that sin that would cause God to be jealous? We actually find it in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 6, we read the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments when God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Exodus 20, verses 3 to 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, when we think about the different ways to describe God, we don't tend to think of him as a jealous God. We don't think of him as like an emotionally, you know, unstable person that would become jealous. And yet we know God is passionately in love with his people. And so as a spouse would become jealous of their spouse if they were to cheat on them, God is a jealous God. He doesn't like it when we worship other gods because God in his great love for us knows that worshiping foreign gods, worshiping false gods is not good for our soul. It's not good for us to chase after the empty idols of this world. And if you read First and Second Kings, it tells the history of the people of Israel. You'll find that well, the great sin that upsets God more than any other is the sin of idolatry. Beginning with, uh, after King Solomon, the, northern, the kingdom of Israel is divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the king of the northern kingdom was King Jeroboam. And beginning with him, he began to encourage the people of God to, to worship false idols. And he, and he put up a, an idol uh, to, uh, of a bull, a gold calf. Shouldn't they know that's not a good idea from Exodus 20? Anyway, they get this gold calf and they start worshiping. And every king in the northern kingdom moves the people away from God as they chase after the false gods of the Canaanites and the neighboring nations. And the southern kingdom has some good kings, but eventually they also begin to, to stray. And, and as they stray, you know, eventually uh, they begin to worship the false gods. And they set up these Asherah poles, these poles that were to, these, to this uh, goddess Asherah who was a Canaanite goddess. And then people would worship at these Asherah poles. Idolatry is the sin that makes God most upset. Now, we don't wrestle with that today, do we? We don't set up Asherah poles, at least, right? I mean, we're smarter than that. And yet, there are so many different idols that our culture offers us, things that promise fulfillment that ultimately prove to be empty. And we chase after them more than we pursue God. And we, too, are guilty of idolatry. Tim Keller has written a great book, a uh, Presbyterian pastor uh, out of New York City. It's called Counterfeit Gods. The Empty Promises of Money, Sex, and Power, and the Only Hope that Matters. And in the book, he gives you a great definition of what an idol is. He says, an idol is anything more important to you than God. An idol, I think we've got the quote here. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you, what only God can give. Anytime we pursue anything more than God, we're, we're guilty of idolatry. We're guilty of making an idol. And of course, with the title, you can tell that the main idols of our culture are money, sex, and power. And, and we know that you, know, you can never have enough money. Just ask John D. Rockefeller, who was asked, you know, when's enough enough? And he just said, just one dollar more, right? You'll never be satisfied. You'll never have enough money. Power proves to be fleeting and passing. Sex never really satisfies for the long term. No, these are the idols of our culture, and he points out that you know, we can easily succumb to chasing after them, but they're not the only things that we can make idols of. We can make good things, like our occupations, or even our children, idols if we pursue them more than God. He points out in his book that, you know, if, if we make our, an occupation, our job, our ultimate thing, the thing that defines us, rather than our relationship with God, we've made our work an idol. If, if we make uh, the happiness of our children our ultimate goal in, in life, then we've made our children and their happiness an idol. Well, the only thing we are called to worship is God and God alone. So how can we resist the great temptation of idolatry? Well, I believe the best thing we can do is to practice the fourth commandment and the ten commandments. We find it in verses 8 to 11 of Exodus 20 where we read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. <clears throat> but the Sabbath day <clears throat> excuse me, is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We know from the words of Jesus that 
Well, that man was not made for the Sabbath, but rather Sabbath was made for man. That Sabbath, a day of holy rest and worship, is a gift from God. And yet we, in our 21st century culture in the United States, don't honor the Sabbath like we used to. Perhaps one of the reasons that we're experiencing so much burnout, perhaps the reason that things aren't the way they used to be, is because we, as the body of Christ, are not honoring the Sabbath like we used to. Only going to worship 18 times a year? That's not the way it used to be. Not with the people of God. You know, scholars point out that the Sabbath commandment is actually the great bridge commandment of the Ten Commandments. You see, the first three commandments are all about our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods. You shall not make any idols. You shall not misuse the Lord's name in vain. And then we move to the Sabbath, which is a communal commandment, a day of holy rest for the entire community where we all rest and worship God together. And then we begin to move into how we treat one another. And if we don't spend the time we need in, in holy rest and worship of God, we will not be able to love God the way that we should, and nor will we be able to love our neighbor as ourselves. We'll be too burned out. And it's hard to love others well when you're burned out, when you're exhausted, when you're cynical. Yes, I believe the great way to battle the sin of idolatry is to honor the Sabbath. So what do you like to do on the Sabbath? Thankfully, you're here. I know you guys are all above average, right? Go more than 18 times a year. Worship is one thing. What else do you like to do on the Sabbath? I I like to take a nap. Honestly, after preaching three times, I'm exhausted. I will eat lunch and take a nap. It's a great day to rest. Another thing I like to do on the Sabbath is I like to go outside if it's a good weather day. Uh, I love to go maybe to Palatter Canyon, or I like to play golf with my son, John. We love playing golf outside on a beautiful day because God reveals himself through his written word But God also reveals himself through his creation. As we spend time outside, we we worship and we praise God as we recognize the beautiful hand of our God who has made so many beautiful things. Another thing I like to do that feeds my soul on the Sabbath and experience Sabbath delight is to to read a a Christian book. Lately, I've been reading this book by Ruth Haley Barton, Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest. And she writes this about the Sabbath. Sabbath keeping is a way of ordering all of life around a pattern of working six days and then ceasing and resting on the seventh. It helps us arrange our lives to honor the rhythm of things, work and rest, fruitfulness and dormancy, giving and receiving, being and doing, activism and surrender. The day itself is set apart, devoted completely to rest, worship, and delighting in God's good gifts. But the other six days of the week must be lived in such a way as to make Sabbath possible. Paid work needs to be contained within five days a week. Household chores, shopping, and errand running need to be completed before the Sabbath comes, or they need to wait. Courageous decisions must be be made about work and athletics, church, and community involvement. When people aren't here on Sundays, where are they? What are they pursuing? Are they pursuing pleasure? Are they pursuing money by working, chasing after that idol? Are they pursuing success, perhaps on the athletic field? What are they pursuing? Sabbath rest. Truly taking at least one day a week to gather together in corporate worship forces us to put things in perspective, to know that there's only one true God who can save us and deliver us. Notice in Psalm 79... Verse 9, there's this great corporate prayer. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Let's read that together. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. That's a beautiful prayer to pray. And most scholars point out that this Psalm 79 was probably written soon after 586 B.C., after the kingdom of Israel, or the, north, the southern kingdom of Judah, had been conquered by the Babylonians and Jerusalem had been stormed and the temple had been torn down. And so they offer this psalm of lament, this corporate psalm of lament, 79. And in verse 9, they pray, knowing that they can't save themselves. They need God and His sovereign love and will to save them. And they need His deliverance. And this prayer that was prayed in 586 B.C. or around that time was eventually answered in 0 A.D., when a little baby was born of a virgin 
in a manger. This only child of God, Jesus, was born and grew up among us and he began to teach us and he began to heal us and he began to show us what it meant to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves and what it means to put the needs of others before our own just as he did when he died on a cross as the perfect atoning sacrifice. He who was without sin became sin for us so that our sins might be atoned for. And then on the third day, he rose again conquering sin and death on our behalf letting us know that in him we have deliverance. In him we have have salvation. In him we have eternal life. And the body of Christ has been gathering on that same day, that Sunday, the first day of the week, to worship him ever since. Amen? Amen. And so we do today. But worship should not be simply confined to Sundays. No, we should live a life that seeks to bring all glory and honor to God. As Paul encourages the Colossians to do in Colossians chapter 3, that in gratitude for the deliverance and the salvation that we have in Jesus, we should put off the old ways of living. We should put off sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous, which is idolatry. My friends, we live in a covetous country. We're always being told to covet what others have, to want what others have, to to buy the kind of car that Matthew McConaughey, McConaughey drives, right? A Lincoln Town car. Or to put on the Aveeno lotion that Jennifer Aniston uses. And I've been using it for years, but I still don't look as good as her. <laughs> Lies, I tell you. We covet what others have. We make it idols. We should t get away of coveting. Put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And put on the love of God. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. One of the things I love about corporate worship in the Presbyterian church is that we always have a prayer of confession, a prayer that we pray. We recognize that this last week we haven't done what we were supposed to do, and sometimes we did things we should have never done. And so we confess our sins to God. And as we confess our sins to God, we're reminded that, that Jesus did pay the price for those sins, that we are forgiven in him. And in remembrance of his forgiveness, we're able to be more willing to forgive others. Yes, we offer forgiveness knowing that God has forgiven us. And then he writes, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, Singing psalms. My friends, this Lenten season, I cannot encourage you enough to spend some time each day reading, meditating, praying, maybe even trying to sing some of these great psalms so that those words can transform your heart. That as we give our laments to God and our confessions to God, we know that we have a God who forgives us and a God who hears us and a God who loves us. And so in gratitude for that love, we thank him with thankful hearts to God. So whatever we do, in word or deed, we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May we seek to do everything in the name of Jesus as an act of praise to him, specifically on Sunday as a day of holy rest so that we avoid the idols of this world, but every day may we live a life that brings glory and honor to him. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, as we think about the people of Israel and how Jerusalem was conquered, we know they were conquered because they were being punished for their sin of idolatry. They turned their backs on you. They weren't honoring the Sabbath as they should. They were chasing after the idols of their world. Lord, I pray that would not be so of us, that we would honor the Sabbath as we should, like we're doing today, a day of holy rest. And it's on Sunday because on Sunday, Jesus rose again. He proved to be who he said he was, the Son of God, the great I Am, the Savior of the world who has come to deliver us from our sins so that we might live a life that brings glory and honor to him. Oh God, may it be so of all of us. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son who is the Christ and all God's people said, Amen.